project called PAVE, which stands for Preventing and Addressing Violent Extremism Through Community Resilience in the Western Balkans and in the MENA region. Um, the, the, the research that we are conducting is also directly building on um, and informed by previous research that we conducted in the Western Balkans um, over the last three years and some papers that we published in 2019. Um, in the current project, we're looking at seven countries, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Tunisia, Lebanon and Iraq. And we aim to generate new knowledge about the role of local communities in fueling or preventing radicalization dynamics. And we hope by that this analysis will help us to identify the right tools and mechanisms that the EU, but also other stakeholders in country can use uh, effectively to address violent extremism by um, building stronger and more resilient communities. Um, I, as I was saying, our, our research uh, is still ongoing and actually this coming Friday we'll have a first meeting together with all of our partners from the Western Balkans where we will present um, the, um, the initial findings. Um, so I wish um, maybe we had this conference one week later, I would have a lot more insights than to share really from the ground, but uh, um, I hope that my input is going to be useful nevertheless. So maybe starting, as I said, with, with the concept of, of community resilience, um, as we all know, this concept of resilience has emerged at the forefront of current reflections and agendas in the continuing effort to push back on violent extremism as a global security threat. Um, I'm going to spare you the kind of the origin of the term resilience from the material sciences and so forth. Maybe I could just say that in the field of political science it has been defined, for instance, as the ability of political systems and informal governance arrangements to adjust to changing political and social conditions while, while keeping the structures intact. Um, some, as I said, have criticized, especially in academia, have criticized the term for being inherently normative. Uh, for instance, some say that it's, it's, it's a kind of westernized or western-centric approach in the way that it's defined, it tends to assign the responsibility for coping with a challenging environment to the individuals. And it also stresses the importance of psychological self-resilience. Um, we think that this application of a Western concept does not always fit local contexts. For instance, it might ignore the importance of the collective and the community in social realities. Um, we also have seen how some um, scholars have criticized the concept for its kind of passive connotation um, because it tends to be seen as um, the possibility uh, or the ability to adapt to negative circumstances rather than addressing the need to change the structural drivers of, um, of certain conditions. Um, it could be interpreted as, let's say, a return to a previous state after a negative shock. And this could be deeply problematic in societies where the status quo ante is actually part of the problem um, and where the actions or the inactions of state institutions, for instance, are among the root causes and the push factors of radicalization. So I would say in deeply um, unequal um, societies, this approach to resilience could delegitimize and disempower efforts to change the status quo towards a more equal and a more politically inclusive society. Um, so in our project, we tried to move away from, from those uh, limitative uh, dimensions of resilience uh, by looking at the role of community agency, um, either individual or collective agency in building resilience. We are very interested in the meso level of local community dynamics, uh, but also understanding that uh, the state, of course, has responsibilities as well as transnational dynamics are important when thinking about um, the concept of resilience. Um, we also consider that community resistance is an important facet of resilience. And by resistance, I mean how communities uh, through collective action can um, push against the root causes of violent extremism, for instance, state dysfunction or social exclusion, can also push against 
the drivers, the direct drivers of radicalization, such as the recruiters or preachers um, that bring extremist narratives, but also the use of nonviolent action against the manifestations of violent extremism. So, as I said, we consider agency as a central factor of, um, for community res resilience and resistance. Um, and in our previous research, we had actually identified, as we called it, three A, the three A's of community um, resilience. Um, so, firstly, leadership figures in a community need to be aware of violent extremism, that's the first A, as a potential threat to their community. Those leaders need to be willing um, through their attitudes to influence factors promoting resilience, that's the second A, and then their actions also matter a great deal. Um, in our project, we look at different themes um, that are linked to, to, to these different concepts, and which brings me to uh, yeah, the second part of, uh, of my input, where I'd like to maybe offer a few elements um, that help us think through what would be important criteria to measure or to assess um, initiatives that are aimed at supporting community resilience. Um, so in, in, in other words, can, what kind of... A, what kind of uh, benchmarks can we use to, um, to assess whether initiatives are pertinent and relevant? And, and I'll mention four key elements, uh, all of which imply community agency. The first one, which is probably more linked to the, to the attitude um, element of the, of the three A's, um, we've heard before in the keynote speech about the reciprocal dimensions of violent extremism and how different forms of extremism feed into one another. Um, so, thinking about the, um, the mirror image of, of building resilience, it's also very important to think about those different dimensions of identity um, and resilience, whether uh, from a religious perspective, but also from a political uh, or ethnic and sectarian perspective. So, we think it's important for initiatives to adopt an integrated approach to political, ethnic, sectarian and religious tolerance and peaceful coexistence and for those initiatives to recognize and to promote or to strengthen intersecting or bridging identities. Um, so it's important to look at uh, initiatives that try to, for instance, support inter-ethnic, inter-community reconciliation and how those initiatives then can in turn um, build um, resilience factors against violent extremism. In our, in our research, we're, for instance, conducting a, a field experiment survey in Iraq where we're trying to understand whether um, for instance, radio programs that are built at um, um, building um, reconciliation and inter-community dialogue can help to lower the appeal of um, the Islamic State and other violent extremist organizations. So that's the first one. The second one, um, which is linked to, to the action dimension of, of resilience, is about the responsiveness um, and the collaboration by local leaders, whether religious leaders and state leaders, in promoting locally rooted values, norms and practices, and therefore in doing that preventing um, dangerous externally inferred extremist influences. So in our research we look at different initiatives such as, for instance, in Bosnia, the role of the inter-religious council, um, or um, in our previous research we looked in Kosovo, the role of local imams and officials from the Islamic Association of Kosovo, um, in how they work together in, um, in strengthening those, those local understandings of, of religion, for instance, um, and, and civic um, um, tolerance, and how that those forms of collaboration can uh, help to, to strengthen resilience. Um, from Iraq, we also heard by our, our partners there how local stakeholders are telling them it's very important to give a central role to tribal and religious representatives on the ground because they are much more trusted by grassroots communities than other actors. Um, the fourth element is, uh, is the role of civil society activism and resistance, as I called it before. Um, we find that in addition to state and religious institutions, civil society actors act as a bridge between them in building community resilience. And we think that the, that the constitution and the vibrancy of civil society organizations are key factors for community resilience. So in our research, we look at different civil society initiatives, such as the Western Balkans Civil Society Hub, or Kosovo Women's Security Forum, and how those spaces are, are 
uh, providing uh, useful spaces to, for, uh, for women and other uh, civil society leaders to discuss ways to mobilize in their communities. Um, we also um, found some really interesting research uh, that was conducted by the U.S. Institute of Peace in Tunisia that showed how trade unions provided a key outlet for citizens to express their grievances and a mechanism to take collective action to seek redress. And in, in municipalities where trade unions were very important, actually, there was much less of a threat and of an expression of violent extremism than in municipalities where those uh, actors were not there. And just to finish on the fourth element then, um, in our research we're looking at what uh, are the different ways of countering online and offline radicalizing narratives, especially through religious and civic literacy, but also through peer group social socialization. Um, and here we find that there's a lot of work done around uh, counter narratives um, online and offline, and we think that it's very important for these initiatives to um, to have strong elements of religious and civic education, but like making sure that individuals and especially young people are uh, aware, so that's kind of the awareness element of the, of the three A's, are aware of um, um, false uh, narratives, biased or manipulated online content and, and how to then um, be aware of those and counter those. We also find it's very important to, uh, to involve former extremists in preventive work with, with young people. I'd, I would have a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I think I'll stop here and I'll uh, look forward to hearing from the others and hopefully for a, a Q&A uh, session afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Veronique, for presenting uh, three A's of the community uh, resilience. Now we, we, we move to uh, the role of laughter in spread of radical right memes between radicalization and resilience. That was done by Katarina Aristic. Katarina is a researcher at the Global and European Studies Institute, Leipzig, Leipzig University. And uh, she, uh, she uh, published a monograph, Im Imaginary Trials, War Crimes Trials and Memory in Former Yugoslavia. Uh, her research interests include transitional justice, memory and media, and she is uh, currently focused on visual memory and, and appropriation of atrocity images in liberal and illiberal memory projects on different uh, scales. Um, uh, her most recent publication uh, is uh, from Norway to N New Zealand, how a Serbian internet meme inspired radical right terrorists uh, worldwide. So, Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Predag, and thank you to all organizers for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here in Belgrade and to present on this topic. And as said, I'm going to talk about the role of laughter, of humor, if you want, in spread of radical right memes, uh, showing that radicalization is just one side of this coin. And that actually, in other online communities, like students that I interviewed, such memes are actually taken as a source for resilience and for digital literacy. So the research on radical right and humor in social, uh, in social media basically describes humor as a strategy for radical right mobilization. So we have this idea of normalization of uh, violence and aggression, which is then taking the images across platforms toward less radical communities. We have that by Fields and Ahmed, by Schwarze, uh, Schwarzenegger and by Billig. So, following a number of terrorist uh, attacks around the world which claim this digital media uh, for the source of radicalization, uh, media starts writing about deadly memes. And this was a trigger for my research. I start looking at these memes and what exactly uh, and how exactly they operate and what does that exactly mean and apparently finding that these hatred messages and invitation to violence are shared among different terrorists from Norway to Christchurch and uh, latest to Halle. So Andreas Breivik and Brenton Tarrant invited their followers to engage in digital activism. In Breivik's manifesto, we have calls for uh, compatriots to write blogs 
uh, while Tarant is inviting the audience to start sharing memes, as memes have helped the movement more than any other form. So what are these memes? That was the starting question for me. And usually these are humorous combinations of text and image which are taken up by online community and turned into viral messages. So they are considered as a very uh, appropriate for online, uh, for social media and this kind of communication uh, because they support this personalized, individualized mass communication. So in words of Limor Schiffman, and I quote, passing from person to person, individual, uh, but gradually scaling into a shared social phenomena, end of quotation, uh, memes are taking social media as a lava, if you want, in creating a particular meaning and creating connection between different uh, events and the way the humor and message about the events is spread. Uh, memes that I'm talking about, so these really radical, uh, right, offensive, aggressive, insulting memes are not coming from mainstream social media. So we are talking about image boards uh, like 4chan or 8chan, and uh, these are, according to Julia Ebner, actually communities of loose, often anonymous, non-hierarchical networks whose participants post such hate speech uh, messages and encourage other members to violence. Uh, research also indicates that popularity of memes should be located in this humorous, laughing, funny side rather than messages of violence. So memes contribute to this simplification of message and reduction to visual and emotional punchlines. All we have are privileging narratives of fear and hatred. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the images, uh, so I would have to, to describe a little bit what I'm talking about. So basically, I'm talking about two memes. Uh, one is so-called uh, Serbia Strong, Remove Kebab, and the other one is Pepe the Frog. And both memes uh, are considered as uh, viral, very popular in online communities. We have quantitative research uh, from 2016-17 showing that they are an, among top 20 memes worldwide among English-speaking uh, online communities. So we are really talking of very well-known memes. Uh, Pepe is the most popular, I mean more popular, uh, and their uh, road to fame of those two memes were, was different, so I will a little bit uh, say a few words about it, uh, because Remove Kebab comes from a very insignificant, I would say, Bosnian war song from Od Bihaća do Petrova Sela. And it was posted online in 2006, uh, and quickly afterwards it gained huge popularity, uh, with this uh, message, Serbia strong, or remove kebab slogan, standing metonymically for removal of Muslims. Pepe the Frog was created as a cartoon character in 2005, and it gained its uh, huge popularity during the presidency campaign of Donald Trump, where it was appropriated by radical uh, or, or alt-right, as Nagel calls it. Uh, for remove kebab entry into mainstream media, which was generally a signal of popularity of the meme, uh, came after terrorist attack in Christchurch as the terrorist self-identified as kebab remover. He was playing the song that I mentioned uh, in his car during the attack and while the whole attack was streamed on Facebook. So this was the moment when global media networks basically declared this uh, remove kebab for Islam of symbol of Islamophobia, joining Pepe the Frog as a symbol of white uh, supremacism. So in my previous research, I analyzed a little bit uh, global circulation of those uh, two memes. And as I was watching images and how the memes are used, I came to conclusion that we have emergence of what I called fascist memory. The idea is that crimes, atrocities, genocide are celebrated. 
you have images of Auschwitz and then image of Pepe the Frog with signaling good job or feels good. These are the messages. Or you have removed kebab put on Srebrenica burial image or on Ron Haviv's Bielina image. Again, that soldier face from the song, which is translated then into hmm, Serbia strong or this kind of positive valoration of atrocities. Nevertheless, uh, as I was doing this analysis and talking to my students, uh, I was telling them about small references in these images, which for me were indicated a huge knowledge of whoever was producing those memes about wars in former Yugoslavia. For example, in one uh, image, we have exact number of Srebrenica victims. So the number 8372 pops up while the violence is going on in uh, Pepe the Frog appropriation in uh, regional context. Context. Then a second reference like for me indicating this kind of knowledge about Yugoslav wars was refrigerator truck in another scene taking uh, bodies from the street. And for me that was kind of a reference uh, to removal of bodies from uh, Kosovo to Batajnica. But, and this is where a huge question came in for students, this didn't mean anything. They simply didn't know these references that I was putting in the interpretation of memes, if you want. So I changed the research design and I asked students, what do they see? How they see this? Do they see this as a, a radicalization uh, strategy? Do they see a threat in these kind of memes? How they understand this whole meme culture? I conducted uh, five interviews and these are briefly results, I divided them in three uh, main uh, claims or topics. Uh, the first one is the sense of expertise among students. So most of the students uh, have this feeling that they know everything there is to know about memes. So they consider themselves, and this is how they describe themselves, as meme experts. They say we are part of gaming community, or they say we communicate daily through memes, but generally uh, memes are considered for inseparable part of their lives, and by no means as a threat or something that is, that is facilitating hatred. Nevertheless, when I asked them about concrete memes, they couldn't say a lot. So there was this kind of, uh, tension between self-proclaimed expertise and a lack of knowledge at the same time. For one participant, for one student, uh, Remove Kebab was well known, and here is uh, what he says, I quote, I participated in its creation. I mean, I remember when it appeared, how it was created. It was one of the first memes from the region which became viral, so for me that was quite fascinating. And then comes 2019 and he is watching a live stream on Facebook. And this is what he says. I'm watching a live, that guy in New Zealand, watching how he kills people. But when I heard the song, I went pale. For a moment, I couldn't watch anymore. I was shocked, I couldn't believe. I start hyperventilating, googling, who is he? Is he Serb? Why this song? So you see that there is a really sense of personal intimate memories of these memes and watching them as unforgettable moments of personal experience. But these are contra contrasted with complete ignorance by other students. And this is 21 year, uh, 10, 21 year old student of management says, and I quote, I've never seen anything like this. No, never. And I'm sure that no one in my surrounding knows this, so remove kebab. As this challenged his self-perception of an expert, he tried to explain. This is not what memes are really about. So you see, I'm not an expert, he is. They are fun, not this. But I'm also not in politics, not even Kosovo. And you know how algorithm works. You get always more from what you like, and this I don't like, end of quote. So what we have here is confirmation of different bubbles, of course, 
And for a third student uh, from Tuzla, she noted that she heard for removed kebab like me only when it entered uh, mainstream media. And what she is getting from algorithm is actually al al always a criticism of such memes as a hate speech. And she tried to find something else and couldn't. So this, I think, uh, was an interesting finding. The second uh, topic or theme is a huge sense of agency that students have when talking about this humor. As one of the students says, I quote, from my ideological position, this cannot be funny. And conversation goes like this. I showed uh, the picture of Srebrenica burial and remove kebab image over it. And I ask, is this funny? And he starts laughing and says, uh, yes, this is funny. This is fascinating funny. For example, this uh, massacre in Srebrenica, now everyone understands in his own inner compass that this is wrong, but then you say, fuck it, Serbia strong. Sending the message, he explains, that we are sick and tired of this war criminal story that is always in, in the media, and we want something else. The opposite position was also, of course, expressed by other students. So one is saying, for me, this is terrible and ugly to make fun of something like this during the war, the celebration of war crimes, invitation to repeat such crimes. This is just a terrifying. But even, you see here, we have this idea of red line. This cannot be funny. But the student who found it funny later says following. There are memes making fun of murder of Džinđić, or former Prime Minister of Serbia, Zoran Džinđić. And for me, that is not funny. I have my own ideological red lines, what is funny and what cannot be funny. And this sense of agency, this idea that they decide where they draw this border, is something which was shared by all students. They might disagree about what is funny and what not, but the sense of agency is there. And the final third team which was uh, mentioned is this sense that students have that they participate in this online diversity and that plurality of meaning is somehow inherent to this situation. So when I show them the images, one of them, for example, says, I ask, of course, what does it mean? And he says, I quote, I cannot say. I could be completely wrong. Maybe they just make fun. Maybe they want to gather same-minded people. Maybe they want to show what they think, but maybe they might want to show what they don't think. Maybe they simply troll without any serious ideology behind. It might be negative, it might be positive. It could be thousand possible things and outcomes. I don't know and I cannot say. And this kind of resistance to, to assign a dominant meaning, the one that I didn't have when I was watching, for me it was completely clear what the images were about, is something that comes up over and over with students and kind of sense that they have learned to orient themselves in a very specific uh, surrounding of online media where they have to search for the meaning by exploring sources, by asking who posted, by looking at the comments, by asking which community comes around this post. So they are generally cautious, and that was for me surprising, very cautious about how they approach the memes and how they decide about their meaning. They're always ready to allow multiplicity of meaning and to, in some extent, is in some extent even allow some kind of tolerance for all this diversity of possible positions from which people might come in online uh, space sharing these things. For example, the student who uh, witnessed the attack in New Zealand, New Zealand said, uh, this is just a confirmation that people do different things with these memes. None in my surrounding would support like something like this, of course, but this doesn't mean that meme means what a terrorist thinks it means, right? So this distinction what was made uh, clear. And to conclude, rather than manipulated targets of radical rights networks and messages of hatred, students consider themselves for experts in meme culture Divi uh, navigating this digital environment with knowledge, 
with resourcefulness, with acceptance of diversity and with understanding of multiplicity of messages. So it is easy to criticize this self-congratulatory idea of, uh, that they have, but what was interesting for me that in their own, when they describe their own engagement uh, with memes and how they talk about this online diversity, multiplicity, meaning, and tolerance, is that they are actually describing their own digital literacy. So this is how they perceive it. Threat is for someone else, for un uneducated, for young, for me as a researcher who doesn't understand the logic. For them, it's not. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, uh, Katarina, for uh, the explaining how uh, humorous memes uh, could be a very uh, serious tool for, um, for spreading uh, extremist ideas. Uh, now we move to uh, another topic. Uh, it is uh, gender and resilience. Uh, the paper uh, titled Overlooked but Not Unaffected, How to Strengthen Women's Resilience to Violent Extremism was written by Emilia Davidovic, uh, uh, who is working as an academic tutor at Master Program Prevention and Fight Against Radicalization, Terrorism and for Integration Policies. And she has also been involved in outreach um, uh, programs and uh, she volunteered at uh, Association Prevent, working on harm reduction program with substance uh, users. Emilia received a Global Campus Internship Award for being the best student of her generation at the European Regional Master Program in Democracy and Human Rights. And her most recent publication is Women's Response to Extremist Violence, a European Perspective on the Paths Toward Radicalization. Uh, Emilia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dragut, and good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to participate in this year's Belgian Security Forum, and it's an honor for me as a young academic to take up the floor with such prominent co-panelists, as well as to represent the University of Bergamo. I used to volunteer at this event in my student days, and back then there was always one panel dedicated to gender equality and women's rights, and therefore I am happy that I have the opportunity to contribute to that tradition. What I want to do today is to open a discussion on the position of women in regards to the resilience to violent extremism. Women are commonly completely excluded from extremism discourse. Even when included, they're mentioned merely as mothers, wives, and daughters of radicalized men. Contrary to this prevailing view, extremism affects all genders the same way it does not discriminate on the basis of religion, ethnicity, or race. In fact, women have been involved in violent extremism long before this term has even been coined. This does not entail that extremism affects men and women equally. The highly dispersed gender inequality affects the involvement in and resilience to violent extremism. In the same vein as the highest earning positions remain out of women's reach, uh, the leading positions in uh, extremist organizations and most of the common combat roles are inaccessible to them. Call for women to join the ranks of one organization is usually understood as a proof of their weakened position or otherwise a strategic move. Yet, women's engagement in violent extremism is twofold. They directly participate as members of these groups, as recruiters, and in a lesser degree as combatants. And they uh, indirectly participate as enablers of group survival and continuation by supporting their radicalized family members and spreading extremist beliefs. In order to adequately tackle the issue of female uh, violent extremists, I believe that it is necessary to develop resilience building mechanisms corresponding to the specific experience of women uh, with violent extremism. Factors of resilience serve to safeguard individuals and to improve the whole society's uh, capabilities to withstand the appeal of violent extremism. Out of many such factors, I chose to speak today about female empowerment and how education, inclusion, 
and support of female-led civil society organizations can help this process. When I hear about the four women in Paris who tried to set a car full of explosives on fire in front of Notre Dame, or when I read about dozens of girls who left their home countries in Europe to join the Islamic State, I wonder what could have been done by the state and the society to stop their gradual transformation into violent extremists, and which skills and personality traits could have helped them resist these extremist narratives. Being resilient means resisting the influence of violent extremism and having the ability to critically evaluate and reject their messages. A well-informed, empowered, and self-reliant person, whether male or female, is less prone to extreme solicitation. Negative structural factors, such as poverty, social differences, gender inequality, conflicts, and fragile institutions, prevent children from across the world from accessing and receiving quality education. Female members of the society are still less likely to access education, especially in marginalized uh, and traditional communities, as well as in developing parts of the world. This is due to different factors, early marriages and pregnancy, their roles in the household, and the fact that educating women is not valued in these communities. Traditional division of labor and gendered social roles leave thousands of girls illiterate and uneducated. Anyone wishing to create a more resilient society needs to take this into consideration and work on equalizing education opportunities for girls and boys. Developing analytical and critical thinking skills should be an essential component of quality education. Democratic education furthers children's attachment to the society and its core values, and children are taught to form personal opinions to, cri to critique and challenge the world around them. Fostering discussion on divisive topics such as ethical and moral issues makes children more open-minded, more tolerant, and understanding of different views. This, together in learning in a positive environment, makes them more resilient to these harmful influences. To form critical attitude, one must have these essential skills, but also access to unbiased and verified information. In general, women are less informed about global and local affairs. In patriarchal societies, men control the type of information women receive and highly influence their views. Encouraging women to seek relevant information and make conclusions based on facts enhances their chances of evading recruitment by extremists. The dominant narrative being that women and girls are tricked, lured, or compelled to join extremist organizations is over-exaggerated but not without foundation. Many rehabilitated extremists have admitted that they joined extremist uh, groups after being persuaded by their family members or friends, but later regretted it, wishing that they had made a different choice. If women were more aware of the extremist group's misogynistic views, their gender-based violence, and their opinions on the position of women in society, they would be less inclined to endorse those views, and it would be much harder for the family members and friends to compel them to follow in their footsteps. Now let's look at the empowerment through inclusion. Risk factor connected to this resilience building strategy are the grievances experienced by women who do not conform to dominant norms. Women with multiple identities have been struggling to couple different traits of these identities, which has resulted in their marginalization. For example, Muslim women are continuously encountering discrimination in the West from the state and society for wearing religious attire. This further leads to their isolation and the isolation of the whole Muslim community and deepens their alienation from the dominant values of uh, their community. These grievances make them easier targets for recruiters whose tactic is to utilize their need for acceptance and belonging. In regards to this, I argue for including empowerment of women uh, within their specific worldviews in resilience building strategies. Advocates of uh, women's empowerment and emancipation must take into consideration the plurality of different worldviews women have. Proposed measures 
need to be inclusive and appropriate for one's religion and cultural standards. Their goal should be to restore women's agency, give them confidence to act independently and amplify their voices. Empowered women make the whole society stronger and consequently more resilient to adversities. To achieve this, the plurality of women's identities needs to be taken into consideration. Women are not a unanimous category. They have different origins, beliefs and customs and they live in diverse environments. Using the same approach for everyone is simply not working. Telling a practicing Muslim woman to break down the patriarchy, reject traditional division of labor and challenge gender roles would be perceived as disrespect of their tradition and lack of understanding of their beliefs. It is a common mistake in practice that uh, to introduce uniform policies and recommendations in different countries without taking the local context into consideration. Gender norms differ across regions, religions and change over time. Promoting empowerment as understood by Western feminist thought can be interpreted as means of assimilation and subjugating differences. Differences should be celebrated as long as they do not harm anyone and are not contrary to democratic principles and core values of a society. Let me show you through one example which was interesting to me. So I believe that all of you know what is a burkini, a swimsuit that covers the whole body, something like a wetsuit that is used for diving. So it was invented by a woman in Australia with the intention to, co to combine one's need for modest swimwear and uh, active nature water sports. And it allowed Muslim women and girls to participate in activities which were previously inaccessible to them. This contributed to the inclusion of Muslim women within Western societies. It gave them the opportunity to interact with other cultures and take part in joint activities. The exchange was reciprocal as the Westerners were also able to learn about religious and cultural practices and beliefs of Muslims. So in that way, this uh, burkini was an important enabler of building resilience by making possible civic participation and intercultural exchange, which contributes to the evolution of this sense of belonging within the whole community. On the other hand, a complete misunderstanding of this potential was demonstrated by French local authorities when they decided to ban burkini. So they defended this ban by claiming that burkini was founded on subjugation of women and that wearing it is incompatible with values of France. This regulation has been adopted as a response to a series of extremist and terrorist attacks in France. And uh, they claim that beachwear, which ostentatiously displays religious affiliation, is liable to create disruption of public order. However, it is difficult to understand how beachwear, which looks the same as a wetsuit, could be endangering public order and security. The Burkini Basi is an example of state-inflicted discrimination. It cannot be reasonably defended by security reasons. This can only further alienate Muslim women from the French society and uh, close the doors to the opportunities that the invention of Burkina has created. So instead of being a tool of resilience building, in this case it has become a tool of crushing the already weak resilience. Now in the conflict between empowerment as understood by liberal feminists on the one hand and traditionalists on the other, motherhood becomes a central issue. The form often diminished the importance of women in the household and insists on rejection of traditional gender roles, inclusion of women in politics and their independence. While this worldview rejects the ideal of a housewife and a caregiver, other worldviews celebrate it. Being a mother means being in charge of educating the future generation of children. It, is, uh, it gives women great social and political responsibility. By embracing motherhood, women at the same time accept the traditional gender role which is prescribed to them by faith or tradition and advance it to the political level and to the public sphere. It offers them the opportunity to moderate these religious teachings and uh, change customs and give better chances to girls of next generation. So insisting on this liberal feminist notion of gender roles and empowerment can make women who don't support it feel rejected and seek belonging elsewhere, which extremist groups gladly exploit. 
strengthening and supporting female-led civil society organizations and local initiatives is another very important tool of resilience building. Women's organizations... Apologies, Emilia, for in interrupting you. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, finish your presentation because we need... Uh, we are behind the schedule. Okay. I can give you five minutes from my presentation. Okay. You can continue <laughs> if you want. No, I just have a <laughs> small part. So, um, after strengthening uh, female-led civil society organization, I just wanted to say that what is uh, commonly overlooked is that women's voices are often silenced. So my final remark would be that amplifying women's voices is of utmost importance for building a resilient society and that without these previously mentioned empowerment of women and improvement of their position within the society and the family, their contribution to strengthen resilience remains limited. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Emilia, now we uh, move fast to the last presenter. It is um, uh, Miroslav Mares. Um, he has done uh, research on resilience of police forces and law enforcement agencies to violent extremism in Europe. Uh, Miroslav Mares is professor of political science at the Faculty of uh, Social Studies at uh, Masaryk University. He is also a guarantor of the study program um, at the Security and Strategic Studies uh, at, the political, at the Institute of Political Science. Uh, and he is focused on the research on extremism, terrorism, and security policy in the Central European uh, context. Um, he is also an uh, expert on, of the Radicalization Awareness Network. Uh, Maresh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to this prestigious forum. It's an honor to share my uh, research experience with you, and I'm also wonder to, to your comments to our recent research, because I'm now involved in one research project focused on uh, resilience towards hybrid threats uh, to, uh, to towards uh, security forces and armed forces in the Czech Republic. And of course, for me, it's also important to elaborate something like a conceptual framework for this uh, recent, uh, for this, uh, co for this uh, topical issue. Uh, however, of course, hybrid threats and uh, extremism, we can see overlap between these two phenomena. On the other hand, today I would like to deal only with extremist threats, and we can see the traditional threats of extremism on one hand, and maybe some new forms of the so-called hybrid threats in, in, in this, in this uh, research field. Uh, generally, uh, members of, uh, of police forces and law, and law enforcement agencies are important actors of contemporary radicalization extremism. I know it's maybe it's could be the provocative sentence because, of course, these people uh, or people in these agencies should fight against this phenomena in democratic societies. Uh, however, we can see radicalized persons and extremists also in these security corps and and uh, and agencies. Uh, and specific threats connected with their activities require also adequate resilience and adequate reaction to, to, this, to this dangerous threat, uh, trend. Uh, on the other hand, it's, n it's nothing new. Yeah? We can see in history several cases of strong infiltration uh, of extremists in various, in various security forces. If you look to the Germany at the turn of 1920s, 1930s, we can see growing sympathy towards Nazism uh, within some police forces, for example, in Prussia. If I can mention to one example from my home country, from Czechoslovakia, we can see strong role of communists uh, before the communist coup d'etat in, uh, in uh, 1948. Uh, or when we are in Serbia, we can mention also relatively dangerous nexus between right-wing extremism, organized crime, and maybe some members of of uh, police units at the turn of 1990s and the first decade. But recently, we can see maybe a new wave of this phenomena. And uh, from my point of view, it is a relatively underestimated issue in recent research, with the exception of Germany. I think that in, German, uh, in Germany, we can see now growing uh, number of literature and analysis uh, on uh, 
dealing with this issue. For example, uh, I know also one, one, one uh, paper uh, prepared by the, by the German uh, Internal Intelligence Agency by the Federal Office for Protection of, of Constitution, Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz, uh, about this phenomenon. Uh, but if I can uh, turn back to some basic issues of conceptualization of this phenomena, we can, we can uh, firstly define this, this uh, security agencies. Uh, it is not only police, but we can, we can talk also about prison service, we can talk about custom service, we can, we can mention, for example, some border and, and coast agencies, etc., uh, coastal agencies, etc., etc. Et, et also some intelligence agencies with law enforcement powers. We can see, this, we can see various models of, of intelligence in contemporary Europe in this, in this field. Uh, and the impact of extremist propaganda is sometimes successful, is sometimes successful also in the, in the environment of contemporary societies. Uh, and uh, if you look to various forms of, forms of extremism, uh, the rising extremism seems to be the biggest problem in European countries. Uh, however, we can see also the growing, uh, growing uh, danger of jihadi involvement in, in such activities. We should basically distinguish between, between two forms of engagement of extremists in police and, uh, and other law enforcement agencies. Firstly, it's something like a randomly expressed uh, sympathy towards extremism or some isolated acts. I don't want to underestimate it, these activities. However, more dangerous from my point of view are uh, activities based on some strategic or tactical intention. It means that, that, that the people in these uh, police forces and other law enforcement agencies act uh, with some goal to change the society and with some goal to be interconnected with extremists outside this core, this, this uh, security forces. Uh, we can mention, for example, disclosure and manipulation of investigation of extremist crimes the misuse of, uh, of investigation against the target entities of extremist hate, uh, the use of specific training and skills for terrorist attacks or vigilant activities, or even planning of the coup d'etat. Uh, this is the most, most maybe significant threat, uh, however, not uh, so serious recently. Uh, I can mention maybe three examples of, of such activities. First is only strategic planning. Uh, Again, I can turn to my home country, to the, to the Czech Republic, uh, and uh, one neo-Nazi activist uh, with the nickname White Cop, uh, in 2001 published uh, something like a position paper or strategic brief position paper, uh, possibilities of our contemporary fight, and uh, he recommended to infiltrate uh, the police by arriving extremists, and they should collect information about the private weaknesses of counter-extremist specialists in the police. So something which can be used, for example, for blackmailing of, of, of these people, etc. It was only plan. Now we can mention the real activities. In Germany, in the last two years, we can see some cases of uh, this uh, verbal extremism in uh, the police forces, we can see activities of, of members of some police forces in uh, arriving extremist chat rooms, etc. One uh, police unit in, in Kel, if I remember well, was dissolved due to, the, due to, due, due to these activities. However, they were not uh, violent up to now. On the other hand, uh, some cases of violence were reported also in, in, in Germany. Uh, and they are connected with, with, with members of, of security forces, according to this report uh, by, uh, written by, by, by Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz. And uh, probably most serious crime was committed uh, by jihadist insider in France uh, in, on, on 3rd October 2019. Uh, it uh, was committed by, by IT specialist and employer of the, of the uh, police in Paris. I'm sorry for my French accent, Michael Harpoon. He stayed five colleagues uh, uh, at, the, at the prefecture of police uh, in, 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 in Paris. Uh, of course, there, that's, it was a description of the threat, and now we can deal with, with, with resilience towards this. Uh, how to be resilient? Uh, firstly, 
the police and, and, and other law enforcement agencies are part of society. So we can, uh, we can firstly focus on uh, resilience of the whole societies towards violent extremism, because, because uh, the, to, to isolate the police is, it has no sense. Yeah? So, so, so firstly, we can, we, we, can, we can start the de-radicalization and preventive programs in the whole society. How, of course, due to the many specific specifics of police forces and uh, and other law, law enforcement agencies, we can we can elaborate also specific programs to prevention and potential de-radicalization in this uh, in in these institutions. And uh, we need also specific tools. Firstly, to detect and to identify the signs of radicalization in police forces and other law enforcement agencies. And we can also need some tools and specific approaches towards de-radicalization. Uh, it depends on the scope of the, of, the, of the threat in various countries, in various, in various societies. What is also important uh, is the international exchange of experience. Uh, it's, I prefer and I can recommend also the, 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 the coordination at the European level. And I can uh, mention that, that also the Radicalization Awareness Network uh, is dealing recently with this, with this phenomena. And of course, I would like to recommend also the cooperation between academics and uh, governmental structures because I think that this academic view can be, can be very, uh, very helpful in possible solution of this, of this, uh, of this challenge. So, thank you for your attention, and I'm open for discussion. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Miroslav, for uh, being very brief and uh, the point. Now we uh, move uh, fast forward to the questions. Uh, we have uh, already one um, question uh, from the online sphere. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, uh, audience to, uh, to be as uh, brief and as uh, concrete as possible in, so to be able uh, to go back and forth uh, as, uh, as fast as, po as possible. Uh, but also, I would ask uh, you to uh, to keep your answers uh, very, very short. First, uh, un uh, first question is um, uh, directed to Ristich, uh, um, uh, Katarina Ristich. So, um, according to your research, two far-right groups in the Western Balkans employ ecological iconography. Uh, such as nat nature, animal abuse, environmental degradation, and so on. And what do you think of such uh, uh, hidden strategy in comparison with more open hate speech? Sorry? <laughs> uh, if I understood correctly, or uh, maybe I didn't. Okay. Uh, do far-right groups in the Western Balkans employ ecological iconography. So it is about merger between far-right groups and uh, ecological yeah, activists. Yeah. Uh, okay, my research doesn't really look in that dimension and there are many dim dimensions that I'm missing uh, because this is just a beginning including gender dimension, for example, which is very important. Uh, so I wouldn't speculate on that. I don't have any uh, confirmation that this is the case from few overviews, I would say that there are some appearances, but how exactly and systematically more, I wouldn't comment. I don't know. Okay. Uh. Thank you. I have, is it, is it, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is okay. I have a <laughs> question and maybe comment for Veronique, although we're going to see each other on Friday, but maybe. Uh, this AAA attitudes, actions, and leadership. Is this kind of universal thing? Because from what you're saying, I can envision that happening in MENA, but not really in Western Balkans, when it comes, for example, for community leaders. So do you see this AAA as something as a universal tool, or is it context-specific, 
or I mean, maybe one factor prevail in one region, the other factor prevails in another. And maybe just a comment on the on this uh, uh, resilience and this criticism. I think the passivity, right? That it's kind of passive. I think the same was directed towards nonviolence, right? And there is very effective response to that. So maybe you can also look up at that, just see how people who are actually preaching for nonviolent struggle explain how this is not really a passive instrument, but be very proactive. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, for the question and comment. On, on, on your question on, on the AAA, uh, it's interesting that you, that you are suggesting it might be more re relevant to the Middle East because actually that came out of our Western Balkan research that we conducted two years ago. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, that was most explicitly uh, formulated, I would say, by, by our, our, our Kosovo partners at the Kosovo Center for Security Studies. Uh, but that was felt validated in the other context that we looked at. Um, the focus was specifically on, on community leaders, whether state leaders or, or, or religious leaders. And so it was about their, you know, let's say their attitudes, their awareness and their actions. Um, but um, by looking at um, the, 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 the roles of other agents, such as civil society activists and so forth, I felt that it also captured um, very, very well what we're looking into. So yeah, let's, let's discuss that further on Friday uh, with the other partners to see whether it's indeed universal or context specific. And maybe there's more to be added to that list, right? More, more traits to be added to that list. In terms of, of uh, resilience and passivity, I very much agree with you. That's why, for instance, I would never use the term nonviolence, but nonviolent action, because the action part is, is as important as the uh, nonviolent philosophy and attitude that's, that's uh, inherent in, um, in, in that approach to, uh, to, to building more resilient societies. So uh, maybe I wouldn't, I, so I, I wouldn't dis discard, dis uh, discard the concept of resilience. It's about reclaiming it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about how to, how to define it in a, in a possible way. And, uh, and so, yeah, again, those critiques are not universal. I think every society we look at has its own critique of, of resilience. And that's kind of the, the critiques that we're trying to collect and to give answers to. But yeah, thanks for the comment. We have in the front row question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maria Ignatievich. I, I come from the Belgrade Center for Security Policies, uh, uh, for Security Policy, and I have two uh, very quick questions, if I may. The first one goes to uh, Ms. Ristic. You mentioned at the beginning, and I agree com uh, completely, that uh, same mechanisms can quite often be used both for radicalization and uh, resilience. So my question is, uh, have you pinpointed or concluded through your research how uh, humor and memes can actually be used to produce and disseminate counter-narratives and actually to mm. build resilience? Or have you encountered some success stories in that sense? And uh, my other question goes to Mr. Marsh. I think your uh, um, presentation and your research is very uh, important, but my question is more uh, research-wise and uh, methodological question uh, from the point of view of, of a researcher. Since uh, security institutions and law enforcement agencies uh, tend to be quite closed uh, due to the nature of their work and the issue of extremism is quite uh, sensitive especially in countries such as the western balkans this can be quite challenging for research so maybe can you give uh, a few tips and tricks for researchers uh, in this area uh, thank you for the, the question. This is actually opening a quite big box, so I will try to be uh, very short. One, uh, humor is classically considered as a strategy for empowerment. It is challenging power, it is challenging dominant narratives, and it is usually seen as a, this kind of subversive uh, mechanism. And this inclusion in radical rights kinds of ideology is commented by a number of researchers, like for uh, Michael Billig is, for example, uh, talking about a uh, huge disappointment. Because we usually think about radical rights and violent persons as persons, people who do not really have a sense of humor. So they are <laughs> too strict to uh, not using this kind of a laughter or this kind of humor which could be actually taken, taken more to, to loose up, to, to de-radicalize if you want. 
So this is one thread of research. And the second one, which was for me at the beginning very interesting, is that most of the research which looks at the humor and radical uh, right uh, situates humor into Freudian kind of theories of uh, breaking the taboo. And then pleasure of humor comes from this um, taking part in something which is forbidden. forbidden. Aggression, sexuality, these are classical themes. What I actually played with and what I think is a relatively productive way to think about humor is to take Henry Bergson and his idea that humor is something to be cherished as a life itself, as, it, as he says, in a sense that this elasticity, elasticity that humor produces is something which is literally enabling society to deal with different kinds of threats. And this is what I think that actually we have in the examples that, that I used. We have this kind of uh, other kind of humor, so other, and other perception of its meaning and usage. Miroslav? Okay, thank you about for researching. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, how the answer is uh, too difficult. Yeah, of course, we have a similar problem also in Central Europe. Uh, and if I can maybe mention one an open society in the, in this in this sense we can mention germany when you can we, when you have relative good approach towards data yeah of course then when we need data in 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 uh, this area so we can start with core decisions but we, they are they are uh, not very frequently published yeah so related to the to the to to, 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 to some cases of extremism in security forces also this is not maybe very valuable source then we can provide interviews maybe with some insiders this can be very important or we can we can do also something like a survey research but many i do not have experience with with, with answers uh, but i also have some doubts about about the about the relevance of the answers so uh, generally you can cooperate with ngos because they they have some some experience with investigation of some maybe hate crimes and uh, if you hear some stories about the, about uh, the relation of police officers towards some specific cases of hate crimes, etc., it can be an important information for, for your research. Uh, I don't want to underestimate also the investigative journalism. Uh, and in Western Balkan, I can I can maybe uh, well very positively the roles of of, of servers like Balkan Insight, etc., and they also can be helpful. So good investigative journalism. Can be can be helpful in this field, but uh, my answer is I do not I don't have simple and easy and valuable methodological solution of this issue. You can combine various sources of data, and uh, then you can cooperate also with some governmental forces, uh, with people in governmental forces who are maybe familiar with this research. Yes, that's, that's also important that because in you have also insiders who want to inform you about about this, about these dangerous trends. Uh, do we have uh, more questions? I have one brief uh, question, and I hope for one brief uh, answer because we are already five minutes behind the schedule. Uh, it is directed to uh, Miroslav. You have been uh, talking about specific tools for fighting uh, uh, radicalization within the law enforcement agencies. Uh, what do you think about cyber wetting of uh, members of uh, law enforcement agencies? It's one of possible ways, because if you monitor, for example, the, the activities on social networks, etc., it is one possible mm -hmm. way how to identify it. And, of course, uh, we should we can develop also maybe some tools how to identify the prejudice and extremism in some speech acts or or, or written acts in, in social networks etc and this is a possible way one of many possible ways how to identify this 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 trends mm -hmm. towards radicalization okay uh, thank you thank you for uh, presenters for um, uh, keeping their presentations uh, in a given time now we uh, have a coffee break. Uh, we will reconvene in quarter to, uh, quarter to noon.
but before we proceed to the coffee break, uh, I would uh, ask you for uh, applause for our presenters because they deserve it, definitely.